Archbishop uh, Josiah Adelopheron became Secretary General of the Anglican Communion in July 2015 and had therefore been in the post for less than a year by the time ACC 60 took place in Osaka. So this is the first occasion when he will be able to present to ACC on a full three time, a three year period. I know that during this period he has committed himself to this task of the full love for God and also for our ending communion and a very, very diary. So now we look forward to hearing from him. Please, I wish you to sign. Thank you, <clears throat> Your Grace, the Chair, brothers and sisters. It is my honor to present my report to the ACC. And this report will be covering three years, <clears throat> at least from Lusaka to Hong Kong. Doesn't mean that uh, Lusaka is three years. From Hong Kong. Now, my report will be will touch briefly on subjects and proposals which will be reported under other items on the ACC 17 agenda. I'll be mentioning them <coughs> in order to put them in the context of the overall work and priority of the Anglican Communion Office. The report will therefore give an overview of the Communion and the Anglican Communion Office from my perspective as a Secretary General. I'm assuming that a good number of you have read this report. So I will be uh, speaking to the report and not reading the report to you. But to begin with, some of you might have noticed uh, a significant change in my role from February last year when Mr. David White took up his appointment as the Chief Operating Officer at the office. His focus on leading the staff team and developing the operation of the office has been both a relief to me as a bad administrator and has released me from my primary outward facing room within the communion and beyond. The Anglican communion is different today and the role of the Secretary General definitely needed to be split. And I want to seize this opportunity to thank the President, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Chair for uh, giving some serious uh, thinking to the, 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 the amount of work uh, given to the General Secretary, Secretary General and coming up with the idea of having a Chief Operating Officer. If you find anything wrong with uh, <clears throat> the title and the job, hold the vice chair responsible because she sort of looked at the job and split it. And we are indeed very grateful. <clears throat> I shall be using the instruments to uh, define my current role as uh, Secretary General. And so I want very quickly to go to the Lambeth Conference. This is the least known of the four instruments. And the reason is very clear. This instrument only meets once in 10 years or 12 years. But I see the Lambeth Conference as a very important instrument within the community. And the reason I will share with you uh, shortly. <clears throat> We're now preparing for Lambeth Conference 2020. And like I said, the Anglican communion is different. 
you begin to see that from some of the terms I'll be using. Before, before now, we used to have Lambeth Conference Manager. Now we have Chief Executive Officer for the Lambeth Conference. <clears throat> and this is because of the amount of work, the practical work that we need to put in place by the Europeans. Will you deal with the language of a of this person? There's a reason in that we can have to decide. <clears throat> we have two parts in order to have a very successful London conference. The practical and the financial aspect is being headed by Mr. Philip George. We call him Phil George. And we prayed, and the Lord gave us the right man for this job. And I'm sharing this from my own experience, what we have seen so far in Phil's administration. He will be speaking to us during the course of this meeting. So far, we have over 500 bishops and 388 wives or husbands who have registered so far. Compared with the last number of countries, we are actually far ahead. And we want to thank Phil for a very, very good job. The second part of the preparation is the, again, practical but spiritual. I mean that in a, in a good sense, the spiritual aspect, which is being looked after by the Lambert Design Group. The Lambert Design Group is made up of representatives from the regions that make up the Anglican Communion. And it is being chaired by the Primate of Southern Africa, that is uh, Archbishop Cabo of Cape Town. Now, this is to assure all of us that the programs, the activities during Lambeth Conference is not or are not hatched by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lambeth Palace, and the Anglican Communion Office. It is put together by the entire communion after due consultation. And I hope this will encourage uh, those who in the past thought that the Archbishop just sits and whatever comes to his mind, okay, this is it. No. And I'm speaking from experience, that is not what is happening. The Lambert Conference Design Group and Phil George's uh, section, they both need your prayers. Now, I have a job for you, members of the Anglican Consultative Council. And it is a challenge. How do we encourage ownership of the statements and or resolutions that will come out of Lambert 2020? As a bishop myself, I have been a diocesan bishop. I know that after Lambert conference, all the resolutions or statements get kept somewhere in the bishop's office. ACC, you have a role to play. There is so much money. We're talking in terms of millions of pounds. Then the talents from every part of the communion being put together, people traveling and people donating. The Lambert fathers meet and mothers meet and they come up with statements, pastoral letters, or resolutions for the ministry of this communion. We would need to hear from you how these statements and resolutions will become effective. There is no reception in many parts of the communion. So it will be very helpful for uh, the design group, even for the Archbishop of Canterbury himself, and 
sales department, how do we sell? How do we make sure that these statements are lived out? The second challenge I have for ACC members is this. A staff said to me, oh, the impact or the success of Lambeth Conference is going to be determined by the press. And I said, no, I reject that. That's our language in Nigeria. I reject that. The effectiveness, the success of this Lambeth 2020 is in the hands of the bishops, the priests, and the lay people from every diocese. The press should not dictate to us. So I give it to you, members of the ACC. How do we stop the press dictating and telling us whether Lambert Conference is a success or a failure? It's in your hands. That's my second challenge. And that moves me quickly to the private meeting. Before the present Archbishop of Canterbury, for five years, the primates were not meeting, and even when they met, there were so many empty chairs. With this present Archbishop, in 2016, it was possible for all the primates to meet. And people thought that was going to be the end of the communion. Well, you can see that it, it, is, it isn't the end of the communion. 2017, again, the prayer meets met. In 2016, they agreed to walk together in spite of the differences within our communion. In 2017, almost everybody came, but three of the primates deliberately chose not to keep to the agreement in 2016. However, some very important decisions were taken. Let me backtrack. In 2016, in order to leave out this concept or this idea of working together in spite of our differences, the primates decided to set up a primate task group. The group was given the responsibility of working out how we are to work together as a family in spite of our differences. I'll be coming back to that uh, eventually. Now, in 2017, I said in my report to you, and I will read that, despite the absence of these premise, the meeting was a success. The positive sharing and understanding about differences and a strong focus on priority areas of mission and evangelism and of concern and action in areas of social need and global difficulty, including poverty, reconciliation, human trafficking, modern day slavery, and creation care. All these. And if you if you if you listen attentively and if you've read that report, you see that these are what we call five miles of mission. The primates took that decision and they are beginning to leave their decision out. The other important thing the primates agreed on in 2017 is the um, launching of what is today known as the Anglican Interfaith Commission. Now, with the primates, we have found out from the office that the turnover is becoming too fast and we can hardly keep pace. It seems in each year we have about 10 new primates. So, there is a problem. The problem has to do with continuity within the communion because primate meeting is a very important instrument. How do we keep pace? How does a new primate gel with the existing primates? How do we equip the new primates in their roles? Because no one goes to any university or theological college 
where he or she is taught on how to be how to administer as a private. So to the ACC, another challenge. How do we equip our parents to do their job? How do we assist our parents to see themselves as a part of their province and not the summation of every bishop in a province so that the primate is above every other person? We need to hear from the members of the ACC. I will give you my reason when I come to ACC. How do we equip them? How do we assist them? This is something I want us to think about. I did mention the private task group. How do we work together in spite of our differences? This task group has been meeting and their report will be presented to the next primate meeting in January next year in Amman. There will be recommendations there will be probably statements, again, ACC members, from your own experiences. How would you advise us on making sure that the statements, the recommendations and conclusions do not end up in the private's office or in the bishop's office? It's very important. That's the other challenge I have for you under that. We have from the Anglican Communion Office also tried our little best in encouraging working together in spite of our differences. For in 2017, we had primates, we had bishops, we have provincial secretaries and some uh, active members from the various regions of the communion, we had a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Just to practically walk out, let's walk together on what it means to be together in spite of our differences. It was so moving that a suggestion came from the participants that there should be another one, this time for bishops and their wives or husbands before 2020. And so in August, this year, we'll be going back to Jerusalem with primates from every region, bishops and their wives or husbands, to again live out what it means to work together despite of our differences. And we will uh, appreciate your prayers. And this brings me to the Anglican Consultative Council. Of all the four instruments, to me, this is the most comprehensive. I'm not looking at, I'm not daring, I'm not looking at the legal implication. I want to talk about the practical implication of this instrument. We have the three orders here, deacon, priest, bishops. We have the lay members here. We have male and female. We have young and old. We have high church and low church and middle church. So every, every tradition is represented here. But I want to say this, and this is what I hear outside, those who are not members of the ACC and those who just do not see anything good in the instrument. Two things. Some say, well, ACC is just a bunch of extreme evangelicals. And on the other side, oh, ACC is full of liberals. It's no good, which means there is something good with ACC. So I believe that ACC would be a, a, a sort of running point for the four instruments, because everything we need for our being together is here. And so you have responsibilities. 
What are your responsibilities? I'm glad that Darren, Darren read to us this morning. And so I am not going to talk about your responsibilities. But I want to correct one rumor that went out before ACC 17. If you remember in Lusaka, Brazil invited us and we are going to hold ACC 70 in Brazil. However, at one of the uh, standing committee meetings, it was last year, maybe did not correct last year, the president of Brazil himself had a chat with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the president, and the chair. And I was there. He said, politically, there is instability. Economically, there is instability, and they were they will not be ready, they will not be able to host ACC 17. I am not lying, I'm telling you exactly what happened. So, what do we do? We had two choices. We proposed two choices: South Africa, and people said, Well, we just had Central Africa, we can't go to South Africa. Well, so uh, I saw the, the the chair now, he was looking down. And, <laughs> and of course, and the archbishop said, uh, Hong Kong, here we come. He said, well, let me consult. And for African primates here, yeah, I hope you, you heard that. He said, let me consult. Most of you don't consult. <laughs> so he quickly consulted. And after that, he said, well, uh, your grace, we will try. That's how we, we end it here. You know, it, it actually needs about three years to prepare, but it's taken Hong Kong province less than one year. I'm glad before saying you already appreciated and the chief of personnel also will tell you how much Hong Kong has done for us to have made this possible. They've given so much, and we pray that many provinces will become like Hong Kong. <laughs> when people say small is beautiful, I tell you Hong Kong is small, but it's powerful, not just beautiful. <clears throat> We cannot all meet like this. ACC cannot meet like this all the time. So the standing committee does the in-between jobs. And all of us, staff from the ACO, we are really indebted to the members of the uh, standing committee because they really, uh, we can cry, you know, we can shout, and we can take to the standing committee our problems. So publicly, we really want to appreciate the chair, the past chair, and all the members of the standing committee on your behalf because they have made our job uh, very exciting. I now go to the last of the instruments, the Archbishop of Canterbury. What do I say? I have to be very careful. <laughs> pass. I won't pass. <clears throat> Now, not only does the Archbishop of Canterbury have one of the most complex and demanding roles primates have, including leading a state church, with the formal and political responsibilities that come from that position, he also has a critical role for the Anglican community. Often I wonder when, after morning prayers, I look at him and I say, Your Grace, how do you survive? How do you survive? He says, with God's grace. You know, as the primate of all England, there is this intense scrutiny on developments within that church, and particularly on the statements and activities of the Archbishop of especially 
from the global south, provinces from the global south. What comes out of the Church of England is very important. And so this instrument needs our prayers. It needs our support. And I said here that there is no Secretary General of this communion who can operate without a close working relationship with the Archbishop of Canada. And to the glory of the Lord, I'm enjoying that. And I thank God for it. Why? Well, simply because I is allowed my predecessor, he allowed my predecessor to live within Lambeth Valley. So I'm actually a prince. You don't need to live in a palace, you're a prince. Because I live there, I can actually participate in the morning devotions, morning prayers. And just that brief time, between five and six minutes after prayers, we get a lot of things done. It is indeed a privilege. The other thing we do together is to have telephone conversations between the chair, the president, and myself. We do that once a month. And that really, it helps me to get really focused because what we discuss, I take to uh, my colleagues at the ACO and we are able to operate smoothly. Now, for the Archbishop of Canterbury, I have said in paragraph 22 that it is impossible to overstate his commitment to this communion. Many of you know that as soon as he took over, at least he stands on record. He is the only living archbishop that has had the privilege of visiting every province within the community. In addition to that, at least I, I, I know this, every newly invented pilot and his wife, both the Archbishop and his wife, invite them to enjoy their hospitality at Lambeth Palace. That all the time. And I want us to pray that in spite of the differences, newly elected primates will honor and respect this offer. Because I can share this, it's disheartening to hear a primate give one excuse or another for not accepting this uh, uh, offer of hospitality. It doesn't sound well within a family. The other thing the Archbishop of Canterbury has done is, as a result of last year's primate meeting, the primates decided in preparation for Lambeth 2020, they will now have regional meetings so that the Archbishop of Canterbury, the CEO of London Conference, and the Secretary General will be in that region supporting the Archbishop to listen to their problems, what they would want discussed at London Conference. So far, he's visited all the regions, and the last region is the Southeast Asia, and that will be in October this year. And in addition to that, the Archbishop of Canterbury gets invited by some presidents and premiers of heads of state. So as to type from his own experiences in conflict resolution. Uh, we were together in Nigeria in October where he went and uh, addressed that country as it was preparing for uh, this election that has just ended. Now, in the face of much pressure and some internal and external criticisms, I would say, if I'm allowed to pass judgment of my boss, I would say that the Archbishop of Canterbury is doing an outstanding job of weathering the storm and seeking to lead this communion 
towards a successful funding integrity. Now, what do I expect of ACC? Because I work closely with the Archbishop, he stomachs a lot of things from the province, from the primates. He says it all the time. I mean, this is the privilege I have. He says it all the time. I'm not a pope. Yes, we do not want a pope, but I want to put it to you, members of the ACC. What would you want to suggest so that this instrument, this Archbishop of Canterbury, will be able to operate better? There are too many distractions. So it will be helpful to us to hear from you. Yes, we don't want a pope because we are a communion of churches. We are not the Anglican church. We are a communion of churches. But this is our main instrument because he embodies the four. What would you suggest at this meeting as a way of enhancing his ministry without is becoming a pope. The primates have tried something, but it will be good to listen, to hear from this instrument, how you will want our admission to perform a more efficient Now, this leads me to the second part of my paper, my role as an ambassador for the communion. You will read in paragraph 26, uh, of the many, many countries I have had the opportunity uh, to visit. And my job as I visit these provinces and some dioceses is to present the communion. And what I would want to share with ACC members is this. This privileged position I have has opened my eyes to see major problem within our community, ignorance. And it is twofold, deliberate ignorance. When you see a primate, when you see a bishop, who knows that this is what it means to be an Anglican uh, church? And he doesn't make it, he pretends he doesn't. That's very frustrating. And there is ignorance, ignorance. I mean, it is ignorance as a result of lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. We have these two problems within our community. In a good number of our theological colleges or seminaries, Anglicanism is not even taught. Where it is taught, it is not Anglicanism. It is self-made Anglicanism, the way we understand Anglicanism. And I believe, even though we are different uh, 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 provinces, we are mm -hmm. Anglicans. I know Anglicanism has many faces, but there are basic things. And I'm saying this because particularly the Anglican understanding of the church. What is Anglican ecclesiology? And it is, this is one of the major reasons for the crisis we are facing today within this community. I will want to challenge members of the ACC. How do we fight this ignorance? Yes, the theological education advice um, director we now have through a courtesy of St. Augustine's Trust for five years. But we need to hear from you. How do we fight this ignorance that is chewing us up and creating uh, further divisions within the communion? I have seen provinces where Anglicanism, I mean, the Anglican order of polity is followed. The clergy, the lay, and the bishop, they debate 
But I'm sharing with you that in a good number of our provinces and dioceses, particularly in the global south, there are no debates. When you get to some of them, you think, uh, and I, I, pardon me, those of you who may feel offended by this, you will think we are a Roman church where decisions are taken and passed down. There are no debates. And when you have debates, the debates are not informed, they are not well informed. This is a major problem, and it will be helpful to hear from members of the ACC how you will want us to fight uh, this ignorance. Now, I also represent you externally. Uh, in paragraph 32, you have a list of uh, the, 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 the hats I wear, but I've picked on three. The Compass Rule Society. This is a society that is mainly American tech. But lately, we now have good membership here in Hong Kong. We will work from the ACO to help broaden the base of Compass Roads. It's an angel campaign. And they do a lot, they give a lot of money to support the ministry of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the ministry, uh, ministries at the ACO. So I will want members of the ACC, if you don't know anything about Compass Roads, please ask the staff from the office and ask um, uh, the chair because Hong Kong is playing a very important role within ACC now and within the Compass Roads. Number two, St. George's College in Jerusalem. I also represent you as a member uh, of the Executive Foundation. We have a gold mine there. The facilities are lovely and the courses are good. Particularly in Africa, because you know we like going on pilgrimage. <laughs> we like going on pilgrimage. Please, please, don't condemn St. George's College. Go and see before you conclude. Don't listen to rumors. That place is for us, and I would want to encourage you. And the last one is King's College London. I was invited over a year ago to be a member of the Board of Trustees. Why? So as to tell ACC members that honestly we have millions of pounds. Scholarship for Anglicans, number one. If you, if you have a, a, a BA from London, uh, uh, King's College London, you don't have to do your postgraduate there. But if you do not have a degree from uh, King's College, you can apply, but you have to do your master's or PhD there. Unfortunately, 90 something percent of those who benefited from this huge scholarship are non Anglicans. So I am putting it to all of you. Every, everything, whatever you want to do, you want to study, as long as it has to do with theology, uh, reconciliation, peacekeeping, please apply, go online, because the money is there. And it will help us to begin to fight this ignorance I talked about earlier on. The other thing is by, uh, chapter 34, paragraph 34, uh, just to announce to you that with the permission, the blessing of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Church of ACC, I accepted the invitation from Kaduna State in Nigeria to chair their Peace Commission. And so I spent four days in three months. I go there, they take me back to Nigeria, look after me, and I do my job. My job is, I'm not the executive chair, uh, it, is an, uh, it is an honorary position, but it gives us the opportunity for them to know that the Anglican Communion is there. We assist, 
we allow people gifted within this community uh, to, to serve people outside. Under ecumenical dialogues, I'm going to leave that to uh, uh, Canon John uh, Jibo, uh, who is the director of Unity, Faith and Order. But I will want to draw your attention to the document that was mentioned in the greetings, the JDDJ. There is a quotation there which I will want to draw your attention to. I'm not going to read it. Uh, Anglican uh, Interfaith Com uh, Commission, I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, the Chief Operating Officer has promised me that he will give me two, three minutes to talk about that. Now, as I wind down, sadly, I want to say that we'll be losing three of our uh, directors who are retiring. Uh, Canon John Jibo is moving to uh, back to Canada to be president and, uh, of, uh, of a university there, an Anglican uh, University College, uh, after serving us beautifully well. Uh, so is our director of calls, uh, Adrian. He did mention it yesterday. Uh, he's also moving on to uh, higher places. He hasn't said that. And thirdly, uh, Canon Terry Robinson, Director for Women in Church and Society, uh, she is also uh, retired for personal reasons. The staff at the office, uh, brothers and sisters, we are very few and we are really overworked. There will be, and there is a need that is not my responsibility is the responsibility of uh, David. Uh, there is a need for us to beef up the staff, the staff strength at the office. But we have a major constraint, which is money. That is what I have talked about in paragraphs 47 to uh, 50. Briefly, I want to say my hands are clean. I'm not involved with financial matters at the office. <laughs> uh, the director of finance and the chief operating officer, they just take all that up. And the staff themselves and the members of the standing committee, they have seen the marked difference that uh, their joint work together, working together has actually brought to the office. However, two points. When you look at the paragraphs I've directed your attention to, particularly paragraph 48, you will discover that two provinces keep this Anglican Communion Office going and our ministries within the community. And 10 provinces contribute 90 something percent. There are provinces that since 2011 have not paid a dime as part of their financial responsibility to the community. They do not attend ACC meetings. They do not attend their regional meetings, and they don't even contribute to their regional meetings. ACC members, we are waiting for your advice. What do we do? The primates have discussed, and they came up with some suggestions. But as I said earlier on, this is the communion. We need to hear from you. What do we do with provinces who are able, but they are being financially irresponsible? That's my challenge. Uh, funding will continue to be a big problem because we are maintained, the AC office is maintained uh, uh, as a from what you give as your contribution to our ministries within the province. And of course, I did mention St. Augustine and Compass Roads. 
that the chief operating officer has some brilliant ideas on how to get provinces to give a little bit more. Uh, but I hope the opportunity will be there for him to speak to all of us. So we need your prayers on how to implement some of the suggestions we'll be receiving from you on these provinces that are deliberately refusing. And I want to challenge members from provinces that are not being financially responsible. I want to challenge you to speak with your bishops, to speak with your primates on being financially responsible. Now, growth within the communion is very exciting. As you, you will read, if you haven't, uh, from my report, you'll see that some of the provinces I have had the privilege of being invited to, they've been exciting provinces. I pick up Melanesia. Uh, John Kafuanka and I were invited last February to, to relaunch the decade of evangelism and spiritual renewal. It was fascinating. Very fascinating. You know, some people just give negative uh, news of the province. I stand here to tell you that there are more exciting things happening. The chief operating officer and I were invited by the Bishop of Egypt. When we got to Gambella, that's in uh, Ethiopia, you wouldn't believe the first time converts. This is not cattle rustling or, 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 or sheep stealing. These are converts for the first time. Hundreds of them. We got to Algiers. I went to Tunis, the same thing. Within this communion, brothers and sisters, there are exciting things happening. Church of England, where I live and serve, when you see the number of young people and you see individuals being picked, I must say this. I met a young person who became a Christian and he wanted to be baptized. He comes from a very big family. I won't mention the country. And he said, well, you think the Archbishop of Canterbury will come down to that level and baptize me? So I said, wait there. So I went to the office and I said, your grace, with my hands behind my back, your grace, I think I have an assignment for you. So what is it? So there is this rat here, this small boy, and he's not sure if you, Archbishop of Canterbury, will baptize me. He's just become a Christian. He said, of course I'll do it. He fixed the date, baptized him, confirmed him, gave him his first communion. That's our official request. <laughs> and if you think it's just a little rat, you have big rats, tough officers, they come to him, he baptizes them. Brothers and sisters, there are exciting things happening. So don't let anybody deceive you that uh, because of our crisis, the spirit of the Lord is not moving. It's even moving more because of the crisis. The spirit of the Lord is moving more, but I believe he will move the more if we're able you know, to get focused on discipleship. I must end on the state of the community, and this I want to focus on my note. I shouldn't finish without touching on a question that is at the heart of all who love the Anglican communion. I want to see it continue and prosper like I've just described. The question is, how should we respond to DAFCON? If I finish this report without mentioning it, I'm sure some of you will say, Josiah is a hypocrite, but I'm not a hypocrite. The Lord has given me this position to stand and speak truth to power. I know that many of you want me to give an answer to this question. 
openly and honestly. And my first response is exactly the same as the Archbishop of Canterbury during the GAFCON meeting in Jerusalem last year. That is to welcome the commitment to renewal and to commit to prayer for GAFCON's activities. What is there to criticize in this? No, no, we cannot criticize that. If that is what GAFCON is about, then it is right for the communion to welcome it as an influence for good and for the kingdom of God. And that reminds me of another group, and I'm a product of this group. So was David Gitari, Pastor Kibangeli, and many others. That is the Evangelical Fellowship in the Anglican Communion, which started in the 60s. Those of you who know the story, especially uh, the members of the Church of England and Church of Ireland and Wales, you will know that in 1960, in the 60s, Dr. Uh, Cantwell, Cantwell, it will come, the name has disappeared. He wanted evangelicals from the Methodist Church, the Anglican Church, the Presbyterian Church, all the mainland churches to come together and start a new denomination. This was in the 60s. And the night of the opening, John Stott was invited to address the gathering of evangelicals. Cantwell Smith, that is his name, Dr. Cantwell Smith, medical doctor. And John Stott stood and said, it is not right to extract evangelicals from their denominations. They should stay where they are and be irritants. This, that is my own word. <laughs> and be irritants there and provoke people to take in the gospel seriously. And that was what led to the founding of IFAC, the Evangelical Fellowship in the Anglican Communion. And the, the, the word, the important word there is a Evangelical Fellowship in the Anglican Communion, stay where you are. And that brought about a lot of revival movements within the community. So also is the charismatic movement. Holy Trinity Brompton. A good number of us here, including the Archbishop of Canterbury family, say so. We all went through that experience. But it's still within the communion. And if Kafka would just be a that type of movement, which is what we are praying for, I think it should be embraced. Now, the difficulty arises when GAFCON involves itself in the structures of the communion in a way that causes confusion and potential division. As a consequence, there is much in the letter to churches that emerged at the end of the GAFCON conference in June last year. There is something that is good, uncontentiously good, and there are also comments in that letter about the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lambeth Conference, which are regrettable. Well, I do have difficulty with GAFCON's decision to set up network in nine areas of ministry announced in advance of their conference last year. And if this initiative was attempting to fill a void, that would be good. However, in each of these areas, the communion already has activity, including staff responsibilities within the Anglican Communion Office, and active networks involving many key players at grassroots level. I also have difficulty with the call for some to be invited to the Lambert Conference as full participants who are clearly not members of the communion and for boycott of the Lambeth Conference and other meetings of the instruments because of disagreements with some other provinces. 
made these fields a very long way away from the decision to walk together at a distance taken at the 2016 Cabinet meeting. ACC members, I know the Archbishop of Canterbury is busy all the time thinking with his teams. What is the way out? And I put this to you, members of the ACC. How do we handle this? <laughs> to prevent a schism within our communion. Finally, this is not a joke. It is something I've prayed about and I've discussed it with one or two people. As I move around the communion, I see our women being very active. In many dioceses, if the women boycott church activities and services, the church will collapse. That's the fact. The church will collapse. And I'm not making it up. I have seen it. I was a diocese bishop. I was an archbishop in an internal province. And I had nine dioceses. The women form the body. The Holy Spirit owns the church, but the women form the backbone in most of our provinces. Brothers and sisters, I want to propose. I did propose something when I first took up this job that at least we should have two members from each province. Thank God you've accepted. I want to propose that we think seriously about a fifth instrument, women in our African communion. I don't know how it will work. I don't know what Darren will say about this. I don't know what the Archbishop is going to say about this. I refuse to discuss it with him so that he doesn't tell me not to do it. But I've led the cat out of the bed. We need to think seriously about cohesion, about peace and peaceful coexistence, about, about conflict resolution. You will soon be listening to, we call her Mama Lambe, the ambitious wife. The work they are carrying out in some parts of provinces. They've been to uh, West Africa. They've been to Melanesia, they've been to South Sudan, they've been to Tanzania, they've been to Rwanda, you will listen to them. So I want us to think, as the church, this instrument, what do we do about actually bringing our women into a proper focus within this, within the communion, so that we can live together. And I joined the Archbishop of Canterbury in calling all in the communion to pray for a season of repentance and reconciliation over past and present differences. The Archbishop needs our daily, regular prayers. And my personal prayer is for good leadership and wise counsel to prevail in all provinces and for a focus on what unites us in Christ rather than what divides us in the actions of man and woman. And I urge you all, brothers and sisters, to join me in this prayer. Thank you for listening. certain that you would like to just have two minutes to look at the screen to see something of his travels around the communion over the last three years.
Thank you.